Hi, this is Stephen Brower from Ratton Valley Community College. Um, and this demo is meant to address two-dimensional arrays in assembly language. Um, so this diagram that's here looks like a two-dimensional array that we were used to seeing in, um, well, Java. And we have so many rows. In this case, there's five rows, numbered 0 to 4, um, four columns, numbered 0 to 3. Um, and so we would look at this element right here um, as being uh, row three, column zero. Um, we would look at this as row one, column three. Um, what is shown here um, were a series of assignments that were being done sticking into the uh, array. So four comma three, four comma three, the value four was put in here. 1, 3, uh, 1, 3, the value 53 was put here, 2, 1, 2, 1, the value 6, 1, 0, the value 52, and then 3, 0, 3, 0, the value um, 21. Um, by the way, the version 4 that is in Canvas steps between each of these assignments so you can see them going in one at a time. This is kind of showing all of the assignments and the values uh, into the array. Well, here's the wild thing. There's no such thing as a two-dimensional array in assembly. It's a one-dimensional array. So, whoop, so what we actually have in terms of assembly, it's a one-dimensional array. And we, as programmers, have to then logically think of segments of this array as being the arrays that we have. So if we're going to have four columns, so the first four elements, one, two, three, four, that's for row zero. The next four elements, one, two, three, four, that's for row one. The next four elements, one, two, three, four, that's for row two. The next four elements, one, two, three, four, that's for row three. And then the last four elements, one, two, three, four, that's for row four. Um, so if we're representing, um, we want row four, um, column three, and we're talking about a single array, we need to do a byte displacement for all of these bytes so we can get to here, row four, column three. Well, for four, three, the four, which is the row number, times, and what this 16 represents, that there's 16 bytes in a row. Since each of these is, um, we're doing this as an array of D words, so each of these elements is four bytes. So four plus four is eight, plus four is 12, plus four is 16. So each row is 16 bytes. So to get to the beginning of row four, we have to go over one, two, three, four occurrences of that many bytes, four occurrences of 16 bytes, four times 16 to get up to this point. Once we're at the beginning of the row, then we need to um, skip over all the bytes in terms of the preceding columns. So if we're doing column three, we need to skip over the one, two, three, three times four, 12 bytes that are leading up to that point. So the 76 bytes is the byte displacement from the beginning of the array to where this element then begins. Um, and let's just take something a little bit closer, uh, this one, three. Um, so row one is here and three is here. So to get the byte displacement for this, it's the bytes that are in the prior row, row zero, plus the bytes that are in the columns prior uh, to this point. So it's the row number, which is one, times the byte displacement, so the one times the 16, one times the 16, um, plus the column number, which is three, which gives us the uh, byte displacement within the row to get us the 28 bytes. So this right here is 28 bytes uh, into uh, the array. Um, what these other ones, as, as you take a, a look at, is that 3, 0, um, 3, 0, it's 48 bytes into the array. Um, uh, 1, 0, uh, 1, 0 is 16 bytes 
uh, into the array. Um, so what's happening is the um, byte displacement can be calculated based on the row and the column. Um, and what happens in terms of um, Java, um, the reason why we start at zero is so that if we are dealing with the first row, it's zero times the uh, number of, of bytes uh, in a row because we're at the beginning of the row. Um, and then if we're talking, um, well, anyway, so that was how we would get within this first row itself. And then the column would give us the byte displacement within the column. Um, so by having the columns begin at zero, if we do get to the beginning of a row, then we don't have to displace anything to deal with the first column that it has. Um, so here's the wild thing. No matter how big the array is, no matter how big the array is, for the elements that we're, I'm sorry, for the subscripts that we're using to get to an element, it's a fixed number of steps. So it would be the row number times the number of bytes in a row plus the column number times the number of uh, bytes that an element has. Um, adding those together gives us the displacement. So if we have n elements in an array where n is very large, um, where we really have like m rows and um, well maybe l columns, we'll just do it that way, um, is that the calculating the byte displacement to any element in the array is order one. So we can very quickly get to the particular place. Now this particular demo here, whoops, had too many things open. This particular demo here, I modified it so that we actually can see it while it's running. So let me just go and run this. Let me increase the font. I know we're in, um, whoops, sorry, properties. Let me just increase the font so it's a little bit easier to see. Okay, well, maybe that's too much. Um, but here, this is showing, now what I did for this demo is I have periods going in for um, the elements when zero was there. So this is initially the row being, or, or the array being empty. Um, so I'll just hit space. And so now for zero, so row four, column zero, the 1477 is being put in. I'll do space, I'll do the next one. So this 4-3, well, 4-3, we're here, the 292. It's a fact we just got two corners. That's totally coincidental. Um, the 1-2, so row 1, column 2, here's the 192. The 1-1, one, one, well, row 1, column 1, uh, there's the 250. Um, that's four values. We have one more to go, right? Yep, here's five. So uh, four, three, now this overlaid um, the value that was there with the new value, totally by coincidence, but we just overlaid uh, the value that was there previously with this value. And this will just end uh, this instance of uh, the program. So if I look within the code itself, well, I'm generating five uh, random numbers. So this loop right here um, is looping five times. And each time in the loop, it'll generate a random row. It'll generate a random column. Um, and so given the row and the column, um, it would also then generate a random value. So I have this procedure, set element of an array, which EAX is expecting to be the row number. EBX is expecting to be the column number. And ECX is going to be the value that's going to stick into it. So logically, if we're looking at this group of lines here, logically it's going to be our array. This is like, imagine this is Java. Um, our array sub row sub column equals value. Now within the, within the um, set element of an array, um, we're about to do a multiplication right here, which assumes um, EAX. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold on to the EBX. So EAX has the row. We're going to just push EBX onto the stack. Um, we're going to load EBX with the maximum columns times four. This is the byte displacement that a row will have. So if EAX has the row and now EBX has the bytes in a row, when we do the multiply, what we'll be re leaving in EAX is the number of bytes um, for the rows prior to the row that we're on. Um, 
So it'll be the byte offset to the beginning of the row. And what we'll do is we'll just temporarily store it uh, into uh, EDI. Um, EAX, we're going to restore EAX with what we had pushed previously. Remember, we pushed EBX, which was the column. So we're taking the column number and we're putting it into EAX. We're putting in the EBX four to represent there's four bytes in uh, a D word. So when we do a multiply here, what we're getting is the byte offset um, for the row that we're in, the byte offset to get to the beginning of the column that we're referring to. Taking that byte offset for within the row to what EDI has, which is the, um, the bytes for the prior rows, um, we now have EDI is the total byte offset. So it's the row number times the bytes in a row plus the column number times the bytes in an element. Um, and so the EDI has that byte offset, which was back on this, the byte offset, that was the part being calculated here. So how many bytes into the array is the element? And so using this notation, array name brackets byte offset, we're going to take the value, in this case ECX, and stick it into uh, the uh, array. Um, Okay, one thing, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm coming back here again. Um, I, will, I will get this right eventually. Um, so this um, here, if we look at the number of statements that are being executed, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there's ten steps, ten statements that are being executed inside this procedure. So no matter how big the array is, it's the same 10 steps that are being carried out. That's why this is order one. Um, so it's order one to get to uh, the byte offset for within uh, an array. Um, this little, this, okay, that ends the array stuff. And so we're kind of done with the arrays. We'll just do the recap again. So there's no such thing as a two dimensional array and assembler. It's a one dimensional array and it's up to us to uh, manage it. Um, and the traditional way that's done is that we do all the columns for a row, then all the columns for the next row, all the columns for the next row, and then we calculate the byte offset to get there. That ends the array stuff. I want to show an issue that this demo has um, that I actually had to fix. So um, let me put this back, take these out, and, and I have the comment here, this is an issue. So gen loop is begins up here. And my loop statement is down here. Well, there's a maximum number of bytes that you can jump with the loop statement. And remember what the loop statement does is it subtracts one from ECX. If ECX is greater than zero, it goes to that label. Well, when I try to compile, jump destination too far by seven bytes. So in other words, my loop is too big. <laughs> so using the loop statement, I can't jump to the top of the loop. The top of the loop is too far away for the loop statement to handle. So the way around it is to manually do what the loop statement does. So we'll subtract one from ECX. We'll compare ECX to zero. If it's greater than zero, we'll go to gen loop. And so this, um, conditional jumps don't have that restriction that loops have. The loop command has a restriction. We can jump, do a conditional jump anywhere in memory. Um, and so the, the other thing about this demo, and it, it wasn't it wasn't my intention, but I was, I was preparing to create this YouTube video. It occurred, and I'm like, uh-oh, hey, this is a teachable moment. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I'll shut up now. I think that's enough, I guess, maybe. Where am I? Stop.